Hello, church family. Thank you for coming to uh, uh, look at Romans 8 with me. Uh, I just want to point out that our uh, video producer, Zach, has uh, made it possible for me to have an office in Hawaii, the ocean. It's right out there. I can't tell you how excited this makes me because now we can, we can have our office and make our videos almost any place in the world. And so I just want you to know that because you might be distracted by the nice ocean waves out there. And so just, just a little warning. And for those of you that might be tech savvy, the whole point is it's a green screen. So just forget about that, okay? Well, here we are. We're in Romans chapter 8 and uh, beginning in uh, verse uh, 18. And so uh, I just want to, the whole point of this uh, next few verses has to do with suffering. Paul is talking about suffering and he is going to uh, give us some insight into how, how God works in our lives uh, through suffering. So we're going to look at that. But the truth of the matter is, when the bottom drops out, when the biopsy comes back, when the Dear John call comes in, everybody turns to God one way or the other. Some people turn to him in faith, knowing that he's in charge, and some people turn to him because they want to blame him for uh, the bad stuff that just happened in their life. C.S. Lewis has said, said this, God whispers in pleasures, he talks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. And I'm pretty sure that's uh, true. God does shout at us when, when he wants us to learn something from our uh, pain. So one of the first places we go uh, when the difficulties come is to the if only question. We, we, we play the if only game with ourselves and maybe other people. If, if I had just paid closer attention, or if I'd have just gone to the doctor more often, or if I'd have been a better parent, or if I'd have been a better wife or a better husband, or if my parents hadn't done so and so to me in my life, my life would be so much better. See, the if only game is that just that. It's a game, and it does not help in any way. The second place that we go is asking the why question, and we ask this of God. Why, God, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening now? And why is this thing that, that you have allowed happening in my life? And so we often ask that question, and people in the Bible have asked that question, and we'll look at some of them, but God seldom answers that question at the moment that it's happening. It just makes it a little bit more difficult for us because... Well, we always wonder why, and we don't always get to know the reason why. So there are some attitudes that were rampant, uh, and there's still, some of them still in, in today's world, during the time that Paul wrote this, and, and even before that. And so one of them is that God blesses uh, righteous people, and he punishes sinful people. And so the idea here is that if you are successful, if you are rich or wealthy, if you have position, if you have prestige, obviously God has blessed you and, and you're, you're a righteous person. And then when bad things come, lots of people say, ah, they must have committed some sin. God is hurting them or he is paying them back for the sin that that they've committed. And uh, people believe that in lots of different places. In fact, we in today's world sometimes believe that. There's a second uh, belief that people had then, and they still do in, in the Middle East and in Asia, uh, particularly uh, people who have a basic uh, uh, honor-shame uh, worldview. And it has to do with limited good. And so there is... Um, uh, the idea that there is only so much good in the world, and it's like a pie, and there's and it can only be divided up so many ways. And so, if if I, for example, end up getting some good, that means somebody else in the world is losing good and getting bad. And so, sometimes people think that because this person is suffering, somebody it may, may not be that they did something wrong. It may be that just somebody else. Uh, ended up getting the good that they used to get, and now they're getting bad. And 
It's, it's unfortunate that people believe that because, well, that doesn't work at all. And then there's one other thing that I would like to point out. And I think this may happen to us in today's world, too. This is from Psalm 73, verses 2 through 5. Just let me read these. So, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. And so it's when we look at people who we consider or think are evil or wrong, they are gaining good things. They get rich. They have good things happen to them. They don't have struggles in their life. And so sometimes we think that that's what's going on in the world and, and rich, rich people are sometimes just evil people, but they, they sort of slide by. God just lets them slide by. And here I am going through a difficult time because I'm suffering. I'm having this thing or that, that thing that's causing a problem for me. So these are attitudes that, uh, that showed up in their day and, and they show up in our day too. And I think we should be careful not to have those particular attitudes. So what I want to do is I want to first look at the person in the Bible who has, beyond a shadow of a doubt, a PhD in suffering. That would be Job. He lost 10 children, all of his riches, all kinds of bad things happened to him. And eventually he was uh, had uh, open sores all over his whole body and he was in a pretty bad shape. And as you read through the book of Job, you see that he is asking the question, why did this happen to me? And in fact, he ends up having some long conversations with God where he discovers uh, basically why this happened. But the second person that's asking why is his wife, who says, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, why... Why is this happening? It must be that God is doing this to you. That was her, her attitude. And Job said, nope, I, I'm not going to do that. And he didn't, and God said, I, he wasn't evil. He didn't do anything wrong. It was because God allowed this particular thing to happen. And then uh, Job had uh, uh, four friends who came to comfort him. And so they came and sat around for a week and uh, were just with him, encouraged him during this time. But then they were asking the question, why too? And they actually came up with answers. And so uh, there are some answers that uh, his friends gave that I'm thinking we sometimes give, not only to ourselves when bad things happen, but to other people when bad things happen. I mean, we're, I think we're trying to help them uh, have encouragement through it, but Oftentimes, that's not how it turns out. So the third person who was asking the question why and answering it was Eliphaz, who um, uh, was uh, Job's friend, so to speak. And uh, he, he basically said, maybe you did something wrong. And so in Job 4, 8, here's what uh, he, he said. As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. He's basically saying, hey, You've, you've committed sin. God is just paying you back for your sin. And oh, by the way, righteous people are blessed, not punished as you have been. And there are people in today's world who suggest a similar sort of thing. And there is some scriptural basis for it. In Galatians 6, this is what Paul said, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And so he is saying that what we sow is what we reap. And that is true many times. I mean, if we sow bad things, we're going to reap bad things. If we sow good things, we're going to reap good things. And sometimes this is actually true. But God said to Job that that wasn't true, that he didn't commit any sin to get what happened to him. The truth is, there are consequences for every sin. Some sins have large physical consequences and some have smaller ones. Although last time when we talked about one of the key consequences of sin, it was 
that when we sin, the Holy Spirit slides into the background and quits leading us and encouraging us. That's perhaps the biggest uh, problem with sin. But, but we, we see sin in different ways. For example, if you run a stop sign, a, a policeman sees you, and you get a ticket, we, that's, that's, you know, a consequence for our sin. Or if you have an illicit affair with somebody and she gets pregnant, that's a pretty big con consequence. It, it causes all kinds of difficulty in families and all kinds of places. Or if you tell a lie at work and get fired, <clears throat> big consequence. Or maybe it's <laughs> you rob a bank and go to prison. It's a consequence for sin. But we shouldn't assume this, especially in other people. <clears throat> we sometimes think we can decide why other people are having these consequences, and I don't think we should assume that for other people, and oftentimes we shouldn't assume it for ourselves, because if we are being punished or uh, put on trial for sin, God is sure to tell us about it. He doesn't keep it a secret. He wants us to know about it. It's like a father who disciplines his kids, and if, if, if the father just goes in and whacks his kids, you know, every now and then, and doesn't tell them why, all that, that doesn't help them understand good and bad at all. We have to explain, this is why we're doing that, and good parents do that, and God is a good parent. He's a good father. He will always let us know if that is what he's thinking. And then uh, another one of um, his friends, uh, Bildad, said, uh, suggested, um, maybe your kids sin. I mean, there were, he had 10 kids and they were all, they all perished. And so in Job uh, 8, 4, here's what Bildad says. When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of the sin. Maybe they sinned and that, that's the reason this whole thing happened. And so we... And I've had lots of people talk to me about this. When bad things happen, they tell me God's punishing me for some sin. And they, and they even have an idea which sin it is because they're feeling guilty about it, I think. But that's not how God works. God doesn't just punish us for our sin. There are consequences that happen. That, that's just the way the, the natural thing works. But he doesn't really come and punish us for our sin. And then there is uh, Zophar, another one of his friends, who said, uh, basically, you're not a very committed Christian. In Job 11, 37, here's what he said. Yet if you de devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, he is going to take care of you. In other words, you are just not very devoted to God. I mean, you, you haven't done enough to serve God. You're really just sort of a halfway Christian. You need to do more for God. And as a matter of fact, this is the way Satan accuses us oftentimes. He wants us to think that we haven't ever done enough to serve God. And correct me if I'm wrong, but in uh, Romans 8, 1, it says, there is now no condemnation. God is not condemning us because we haven't done enough. But Satan always comes and accuses us of that sort of thing, and we sometimes accuse ourselves. And then uh, the, the next person, the next friend that um, <laughs> talked to Job was uh, Eliphaz, and he said, basically, you're just being disciplined by God. Uh, Job 15, 2, he says, Would a wise person answer with empty notions or fill their belly with hot east wind? No, God is just disciplining you because you, you just said the wrong thing or did the wrong thing. And as a matter of fact, there is a, a, you know, a scripture in 1 Corinthians 11 that talks about this because God actually does sometimes discipline us. And in, Romans, in Hebrews 12, he says the same thing. So here is 1 Corinthians 11. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. If we were more discerning with regard to ourselves with the kinds of bad things we might do, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. And so the idea is sometimes we are disciplined and sometimes we make that assumption. Somebody gets really sick, they're in the hospital, they have to lay there looking up at God, and we just assume God must be disciplining them. And uh, we don't know what they did, but they must have done something, and so God is doing that. And I'm not thinking that we ought to always assume that, because that's not always the case. In fact, it may not even be the case usually. 
Here's the deal. Suffering, during suffering, is when most people who decide to stop believing in God do it. Suffering causes us to stop believing and trusting in God. It's just the way life works. And sometimes we, we just feel like we've had too much and we go on. And then, so, uh, there's another, number seven, uh, God is not really a God of love. We might think that. You know, some people have said that. Or there are some things that are too big even for God. God just can't, can't do everything, and so there's some things too big. And so he just can't take care of your suffering. Or sometimes we think God just got caught by surprise. Wow, he didn't see that coming. And so you're caught in the middle of this uh, suffering that he might have saved you from if he'd have been a little smarter. But the last step in this stage of moving away from trusting God, I think, is, you know, there really isn't a God at all. And when we come to that place, we have really made a hard decision. And there's lots of folks in the world who've done that. Uh, I, I heard about a, a famous uh, comedian who said, uh, why should I pray to God to help me find my keys when he stood by during the Holocaust and did nothing? You see, what we're assuming, what he was assuming is that he knows everything about God and everything about the world and everything that has happened. And I, and I also not only know those things, but I know what God's motives are. And when we make those kinds of assumptions, we're saying, I'm as smart as God. And if we were as smart as God, we'd understand those things, but we're not. We don't always understand what God's plan is. And so we probably shouldn't decide what is the best thing for God to do. And it happens in our life too, and it particularly happens when we're in the middle of hard things or suffering. It really makes it harder and harder to trust God, but we can make a decision to do that. Well, we as uh, individuals and as Bible students put um, um, suffering in uh, different categories. The first suffering would be, I mean, the, the first category would be, number one, you deserve suffering. It's the result of sin. And so, and so we, we quote this uh, scripture, which is in Numbers, 23, uh, Numbers 32, 23, where it says, but if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Now, this is a, a God talking to the Hebrews, explaining that they, here's some certain things they need to do, and if they don't do those things, they will be sinning against the Lord. And if they don't do those things and sin against the Lord, their sin will find them out. This is an extraordinary verse because it's, it talks about sin the way we've been looking at it in the book of Romans. Sin is something that pursues us. It it's going gonna, it's gonna to make sure that, that we are found out about our sin. It pursues us. And so that's one of the evils, terribly bad things about sin, and the reason we should avoid it, if at all possible. And so, so that's one category of um, suffering is, you know, it's deserved suffering. Uh, there is also another category of um, uh, innocent suffering, like, like Job, for example. And uh, Job <clears throat> was innocent in, in all the suffering that he had. And there are people in today's world who are innocent. I mean, natural disasters, uh, racial prejudice, uh, chronic sickness, heavy, hard diseases like cancer, those kind of things. <clears throat> we might think in our heart, maybe God is punishing them because this happened to them. But the truth is, they were just... In the, in the way of the storm, and that's the way it happened, or they happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't think we should assume, even in these kind of situations, that God is punishing people, that he is disciplining people. Because if, if that's true, it's not for us to decide for them. And if that's true, God will let them know uh, about that. And then the third category would be a righteous suffering, like... Job, <clears throat> or no, like uh, like uh, Cain and Abel, actually. See, uh, Abel did the right thing, and it caused Cain so much difficulty, he just couldn't deal with it, so he killed his brother. 
It'd be the same today for Christians in Iran or even in India, other places where you do the right thing. You talk about Jesus, you worship him, and they're likely to come and kill you. And so <clears throat> righteous, suffering for righteousness. There is another category of suffering or pain, which would, I would call um, decided pain. You decided to have it, like you decide, I'm going to get a tattoo. And there's some pain involved there. It's, you, you know, it's your choice. Or <clears throat> maybe you go and spend money like it's, like it's water, going out of style. And so you end up <clears throat> with all kinds of money problems that you have to deal with. See, those are basically consequences, but you, you've chosen them. And that's not what we're talking about here. This is suffering that a person has to go through because, well, it's not their fault. So we're going to talk about that and look at it a little bit more as we go along. So if Job had a PhD in um, suffering, then Paul is working on his PhD, and these next few verses are his uh, thesis for his uh, PhD. And he, he definitely understands pain and suffering. I mean, uh, when he became a Christian, he lost his family, he lost money, he lost his career, he lost his uh, prestige, he lost his friends. And after he became a Christian, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was brutalized, he was incarcerated, and eventually he had a thorn in the flesh. I'm pretty sure he understands suffering. And so this is uh, kind of like Paul does, has been doing all through the, the book of Romans. He, he gives his thesis statement for what, he's gonna, what, what he believes and what he thinks, and then he goes on to explain why this is true. And so here is his uh, uh, thesis statement. It's uh, uh, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So he decided that he must pull himself out of the present and push himself into the future. And, and notice he used the word consider. It's the same word uh, reckon or determine that was back in chapter 6. When it, It's, a, it's a, a business word that means to, to determine that this is true or to decide that it's true for you. And so he, he said, I have to determine that it's true that these present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So what is the glory that will be revealed in us? Well, one of these days, we're going to be in heaven, and that's the glory. And we have no idea what that's going to be like. I mean, we have some idea, but I'm betting that we're a thousand points off in all the glory that is going to be ours when we get to heaven. And the truth of the matter is, this is not all that unusual for what we do. I mean, uh, in, in small areas of suffering. So here we are, we have a, a, a toothache. And so what do we do? We make an appointment with the dentist. And then we get there and he sticks a needle in our gums. And then he gets a drill and drills our tooth. And then he puts all this stuff in there. And then, well, pretty soon, it's not that much fun. But why, why do we choose that? We know that after he fixes that tooth, it's not gonna hurt anymore. And it's the same with open heart surgery. I mean, I've not had open heart surgery, but I've known lots of people who did. And my bet is if you have open heart surgery, it's gonna hurt because they told me that it hurts. Well, why do they do that? Why are they willing to go through all that pain? Because after it's over, their life is gonna be way better. And that's exactly the way Paul is talking about here. He's talking about this principle, delayed gratification is, is the way that he wants to deal with uh, suffering. And so, and so this is, we're just going to kind of connect the dots together for suffering. And the first dot is I need to lean forward into my future glory. Our future glory is going to be so extraordinary. My guess is that when we get there and somebody brings up, what about that uh, thing back there? What thing? I don't, I don't think we'll even 
Remember that. Well, he, Paul goes on in uh, <clears throat> verse 19 when he says, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Now, even creation is groaning. Even creation is waiting for something. We're waiting for our moment when we get to be in heaven, and creation is doing that too. And who are the sons of God that it's talking about here? That's you and me. We are the sons of God. And so when we get to, to heaven, to our glory, we're going to get new bodies, and so is creation. All of creation is going to get redone. It's going to get a new body too. It's going to be all kinds of things better. And they're going to be liberated from their bondage to decay. In fact, it's so true that we have um, laws of thermo thermodynamics that suggest the world is getting less and less organized. The farther along we go, it gets less and less organized. Because why does all this happen? It's because sin came into the world. And sin disorganized everything that God planned. I mean, he created this entire universe that got disorganized and he created people and we got disorganized. And one of these days, we're all going to be liberated from that. It's like uh, the, the word here is like uh, Solomon used in Ecclesiastes. Everything is in frustration. He was frustrated, subjected to frustration. Uh, it's, it's just not worth much. And so... Creation is frustrated, all because sin came into the world, which leads us to believe what we've already been talking about. Sin is a big deal. Sin is big, it's evil, it's terrible, and we should avoid it in every possible way we can. Well, one of these days, maybe not too far in the future, Jesus is going to return, but it's going to be a liberation from bondage for creation. And at the same time, we will be liberated because we'll have new bodies and all kinds of things will be changed forever. And so the second dot of connecting all the uh, ideas about suffering is everything in creation is cursed. And it's not, it's not because it shows that way. It's not because that's just the way it is. It's that way because of sin. Sin has allowed it, made it happen, and God allowed it to do that. Everything is paying the price. Even you, you're paying the price too. So what, 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 how is your life going? I, I mean, as you get older and older, see, uh, people, people talk about the fact the new 30, you know, 40 is the new 30, and uh, 50 is the new 40. I mean... We, we all realize that things are falling apart in our bodies the older that we get. And so there comes a time when we have to get glasses, and then there comes a time when we have to have a knee replaced, and then there comes a time when everything else has to be replaced. It's, it's the way life is. And when we talk to God and say, why, why did I deserve this? I mean, why am I getting this? And God's response might be, because you were born. You're just here in the world. That's all messed up. It's not um, always cause and effect, you know, the suffering that you go through. Sometimes it could be, but it's not always. But hope takes us into the future where God reigns. And when we lean forward into the future, it helps us to remember what is coming for us. For example, now we have decaying bodies, but in the future, we're going to have resurrected bodies. Now we have earthly pain <laughs> in heaven. We're going to have heavenly bliss where there's no more pain, no more tears, no more anything like that. And now time is short, but in the future, time is going to be forever. It will never end. We can't even comprehend that. 
And this is where hope helps us with our perspective. Perspective is seeing things from God's point of view. When we see things from God's point of view and look toward his hope, it changes everything. It really pays off for us. So the next verse here is verse 23, Romans 8, 23, where he says, Not only so, but we ourselves who have the, uh, the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly, um, as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Now we groan because life hurts, uh, because the world is broken, and, and because we have Christ, we've accepted Christ as our Savior, we're the first fruits, and the Holy Spirit in us is what makes that true, makes us, we're the first fruits of the Spirit. Now it's true, sometimes God intervenes in uh, suffering in miraculous ways. Even Jesus did. Jesus often made the lame to walk. He made the, the blind to see. He even raised Lazarus from the dead. But the truth is, even Lazarus died again. And eventually, that's what happens to all of us. And so we, we can hope for or think for think we would like or ask God to miraculously change things, and maybe he will, but he may not. And so in that case, we need to put our hope in him and what he's going to do. So the third dot is when our adoption is complete, when, when our bodies and our world will be redeemed, our adoption is when we get to heaven, when we're glorified. When we get there, everything is going to change, not only for us, but for all of God's creation. And so the next verse is um, uh, verse 24 and 25. For in this hope, we were saved. See, God wants to give us hope. For in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to trust him, to look toward his promises. He's given us lots of promises. And we have the hope that he has a plan for us. And not only does he have a plan for us, it's guaranteed. It's already determined. And when Paul talks about this plan, he talks about it not like it may be coming, it's probably coming. He talks about like it's already happened even though we're not there in heaven yet, but it's a done deal because it's already happened in God's eyes because he's already made the decision. And so the fourth dot is God offers hope in the middle of suffering. The truth is he can't make you hope. You have to make the choice to hope. And it takes perseverance and it takes patience and it takes faith. Actually, creation's waited quite a long time, don't you think? And we need to have perseverance and faith through, through even these difficult times. It's, it's what faith does. You know, it's interesting. We often talk about the fact we want to live by faith, but then when we have to, we get upset with God because we have to live by faith. We, being Americans and perhaps even citizens of the world, we want instant gratification. We would like to have it today and, if possible, this very moment. And to God is not on our timetable, as we have discovered. Uh, so, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The uh, fifth dot is the Spirit intercedes for us. When we're in pain, our weaknesses are really show up and, and are great. We, we, we don't even know how to pray when we're in great pain. We don't even know how to pray for ourselves or even for others. Sometimes uh, when we have a loved one who is going through terrible times. Maybe they, it was like uh, when my mother had cancer. It was, it was difficult. And 
I didn't know how to pray. I, I would pray, God, heal her body. He, heal her. Keep her from having all this pain. And then the longer it went on, the more I said, God, please take her home. Please let, let her out of all this uh, difficulty. And so we don't always know how to pray. And it's good that the Holy Spirit does know how to pray. He, he knows God's heart and mind. And God, and it, it says there, God, he who searches our hearts, that's God, knows the mind of the Spirit. And the Spirit knows the mind of God. And so we can trust him to pray for us when we have no idea how we ought to pray. The Spirit always intercedes for us in God's will because he knows what God's will is. And when things are going bad, you can just assume things are pretty normal here on earth. <clears throat> it means you're human. That's the way things are. So here's verse 28, which is the verse we spend a lot of time quoting oftentimes, especially to other people. And we're going to spend more time on this next time, but <clears throat> I want to spend just a minute here. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so God is the one who's working these things. It's not, it, it's not us making them work, and it's not nature that's making things work, or just natural sort of things. It's God who's making things work. And um, uh, he has a, a plan for us. And the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in his plan here. But the good that he's talking about here, the good of, of those who love him, has to do with his purpose for us. And he has a purpose. And in fact, in the next verse, verse 29, he tells us what that purpose is, which is for those, that's us, God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. That's his purpose for us. That's his whole purpose. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his Son. And so when Paul says that God is working all things for our good, that's what God's doing. He's helping us to become conformed to the image of his Son. Now, we often think that what this means is that we we will get what we want, that this is going to turn out to be great. And, and I, I don't know what the, what the purpose for this suffering is now, but one of these days I'm going to see the silver lining of the cloud. That's, that's not necessarily how it's going to be. It is sometimes we don't ever get to see that, and especially if the suffering is long and hard, and God is working on changing some aspect of our life, our attitudes, our, maybe our morals or character or something, We'll never actually know that unless we trust him to know that he is actually doing something in our life. And it may be later in life that we know that, or it may not, we may not ever know. And so the sixth dot here is in all things, God is always working. He is always working in everything. No matter whether they're wonderful or whether they're terrible, God is always working. And so, well, just let me ask you this. What do you think? When Paul was put in prison, you think God was working? How about when Paul had a thorn in his flesh? Was God working there? How about when Jesus was arrested? Was God working there? How about when Jesus was beaten? Was God working there? How about when Jesus was nailed to the cross? Was God working there? How about when Jesus rose from the dead? Was God working there? See, we tend to not see God working in areas that are painful and suffering. But God is always working, and he always has worked in every situation of our life. The good ones, the bad ones, and the truly ugly ones, he is always working. So, here we go you need to remember a couple of things. Number one, we're not alone. The Holy Spirit lives inside us. He is the one who gives us guidance and gives us encouragement and prays for us and helps us to 
uh, understand what God is doing in our life. We're not alone. Number two, it's okay to groan. It's not a lack of faith. It's just being human. There are some times we just groan. And the Holy Spirit is there. And he will groan with us and speak words to God that we have no idea what to say. And then, number three, we will decide something. You're going to decide something in the middle, in the beginning, and in the middle, at the end, during suffering. You're going to make a decision. And you're either going to trust the Lord, decide to trust the Lord, or you're going to decide to take control. Now, you've seen this, this graph many times. Most of you have seen this many times where things come up and we get fearful because we don't know what's, what's going to happen here. And so we have to decide, am I going to have faith and trust God and surrender my life to him? Or am I going to take control of my life and then do what I think is best for me? See, we have those choices all the time. And that's the same choice in the middle of suffering. Whether it's easy or hard or really terrible, we have the choice, am I going to trust God or not? Or am I going to trust myself? And so you have to make the decision of what you're going to do. And so here are the uh, six dots. Number one, first dot, I must lean forward and trust the future promises of God by faith. It's the only way, because things are so bad here sometimes, we can't assume that things are going to get, get better all the time. And then maybe they will. Often they do. And often God does uh, bring, bring those things to, to an end. But in the middle, it's pretty hard. And so we need to lean forward and trust God's promises for the future. Number two, I live in a broken world. It's It's broken. And it's broken because of sin. And I suspect, although I don't know that this is true, I suspect it becomes more broken based on the more sin that is produced in our world. I'm, I'm thinking it just gets more and more broken. And then number three, my body and this world will be redeemed when I am adopted by God in heaven or when I'm glorified or when I end up in heaven not only am I going to be redeemed, but the whole universe is, and then we get to enjoy that afterwards. And then number four, God offers hope in the middle of suffering. He always offers hope, and the Holy Spirit will point us in that direction. And so just let me suggest that you follow the Holy Spirit's lead toward that hope that God gives us for how it's going to be when we are in heaven. And then number five, the Holy Spirit intercedes for me. He knows my heart and he knows God's heart. And he's always interceding for me to bring my case to God and to bring God's love and concern to me. And then number six, God is always working. He's always working all around you, even if you can't see him. Sometimes we see him and sometimes we don't. But he is always working and doing things. And one of the things that we might choose to do is find out where he's working and go join him. So one of the things that we know for sure is that our future, if we're a Christian, if we've accepted Christ as our Savior, is already determined. It's all determined, and it's going to be as glorious as it can possibly be. And so getting to heaven and all it includes means getting all that Christ got, including suffering. He ended up with suffering too, and we're going to get everything he got. We're going to end up with some suffering too. In fact, he told us that. We're going to suffer in this world, if for no other reason, when we just do the right thing, when we do his will, we will suffer. And we get to surrender full control if we choose to. And the Holy Spirit will always lead us toward giving full control to God. That's his goal, because he wants us to be just like his son. So the question is, are you still interested? Are you interested in 
pursuing God and trusting him and letting him lead you toward being more like his son.